Kia ora, talofa, namaste, haere mai, and welcome to this week's episode of The Niche Cast. Coming at you, I wouldn't say it's a glorious Aotearoa morning, but it's a big old Aotearoa morning. We're just here to sp- spread some positive energy to help you raise your mana. We're all just here to raise our own mana. Just worry about your own mana, raise it up, lively up your mana. And enjoy yourself, have a bit of fun, stay happy, stay chirpy. We're from the Niche Cache, the niche-cache.com, where you can a whole lot of football fans content for you to read. We've got a lot of Warriors content you can read as well to learn about Warriors footy. Big old flying Kiwis yarn is up live. Also got a NRLW breakdown for the first round of their footy. Kiwi County Tour stuff has been happening. Lots of Kiwi sports to read about on our website, theniche-cache.com. And of course, we've got a bunch of podcasts you can listen to on YouTube and all the podcast platforms, as well as our subscriber podcast that we recorded on Tuesday. That goes out to the Patreon whānau and anyone with a paid Substack subscription. If you really enjoy the Niche Cache, you enjoy our mahi, you enjoy our Kiwi sports insights and kōrero. Like some of it's insights, some of it's just also waffles. So we won't big up ourselves too much because we do ramble. But if you enjoy it, if you like it, you can support it directly. And you can basically fund it yourself by joining the Patreon Fano or signing up to a paid Substack subscription. You don't need to do either to access Niche Cage content. But if you do, there is an extra podcast for you as well. So whatever way you want to support the Niche Cache directly uh, through donations. We also had a, let me just shout out this brother. Just need to get into the, uh, get into the emails here. Because we do have a buy me a coffee page. And shout out to Stacey Parrott, who uh, bought us a few coffees. So they basically made a direct donation to the Niche Cache. You can do uh, the buy me a coffee route. That's more of a sporadic one-off donation. Or you can join the Patreon whānau and and or sign up to a paid Substack subscription. All that money goes to the niche cache, keeping everything moving and grooving. And we have an extra podcast there that goes out to the Patreon whānau and paid Substack subscribers. If you do want extra niche cache and you don't want to pay for anything, that's all good as well. Just tell a friend, hit up the website, subscribe on YouTube, all that stuff helps us out as well. And sign up to our twice a week email newsletter via Substack, the nichecache.substack.com. That's completely free. And that's basically the niche cache sent straight to you on a Monday and Friday evening. Tomorrow is a Friday. So that means I'll have a bunch of Kiwi NRL notes. Have a bunch of uh, cricket thoughts as well. Nick of the Wildcard, any thoughts what you're going to have for your Friday email dispatch? Well, I mean, it will be the morning after the start of the FIFA World Cup. So I'm assuming there will probably be something along those lines. And then uh, at least keeping an eye out. I exhausted a couple of flying Kiwis yesterday. But trying to keep an eye out on some of them transfer rumors and stuff like that with the flying Kiwis. The one stuff that doesn't like is a bit too speculative to get into the actual article but I'll, I'll list that stuff in the um in the email now and then when i when i can find a few we're talking about so we do write things specifically for the email newsletter and you get all the podcast information as part of that and links to the latest things we've written on our website the cashcom so that email dispatch is pretty damn funky if you ask myself and i'm sure the wild card will uh, second that so sign up to that Tell a friend, just be here with us, spreading the positive energy, positive vibes, Jarasta Farai. Let's get a bit of mindfulness. Aye, aye. I've got an effort right here from Mr. Joseph Campbell. The goal of life is to make your heartbeat match the beat of the universe, to match your nature with nature. Mm. That just made me feel comfortable. That they just it is say there's it's quite a soothing one. Like everything I was saying in that opening waffle about, you know, there was a lot of positivity uh, positivity there. There was a lot of like let's be positive, raise our mana, light and love and all that stuff. And you just oh, gave me the warm fuzzies. Being in alignment with nature. Like there's nothing better. That's what we're here to do. It's fantastic. And it's kinda like 
it's that simple, eh? Like just just align align you like the nature of it. You can't you can't adapt, despite the fact that there's like thousands of years years of humans trying to do exactly this mostly futilely as well um i would say entirely futilely you can't actually make nature nature adapt to you mm. you have to adapt to nature in fact you don't even have to adapt to nature you just have to stop not adapting to nature like it happens naturally that's why it's called nature right and like basically you just need to slow down hear the birds chirping maybe a bit a few natural vitamins of the the fungi variety of the green leafy variety, whatever you need to do to slow down and connect <laughs> to nature, suddenly you're aligned with nature. You're, we're always part of nature, but then you're actually part of nature instead of your your human meat sack going crazy like oh rah 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 rah. No, just slow down, get in tune with nature, love yourself, kia kaha, beautiful mindfulness. They're in tune with. How about that? in tune and aligned with the uh, the opening waffle and that's what we're here for to align with nature Whew. have you seen this um black cap squad new black cap squad yeah. for uh t20 cricket in the uae and england yeah i did see this and i had absolutely no idea that there was t20 cricket coming up in the uae or england i had no clue about this i had just seen you know they just announced the summer schedule earlier on in the week as well so there's there's a bit of that a lot of t20 cricket being played there not a lot of odi cricket although it is coming straight after an odi world cup so i think that's probably the context you need to keep that in is they will be playing a lot of odi cricket prior to the home summer um and there's no test matches until February, but when we do get test matches, they're good ones. It's South Africa and it's Australia. Like, it's exciting stuff. There'll be good crowds for that. Um, I would... Uh, as just for T20s in the UAE, <laughs> if so, but, you know. Yeah, it's, uh, it's... As people who are here to cover such Aotearoa sporting matters as the Black Caps, nothing about this is interesting. And that's how I view it right now. And I would... Another update is to stay curious about the uh, upcoming test schedule because there are some home tests against South Africa locked in, but they might not look how folks expect them to look because apparently the cricket, uh, the South African T20 League, which I think is going, like, some of these leagues are going to be, they'll vanish in a couple of years, right? Like, there's yeah. so many new T20 leagues, like the Major League Cricket in America, shout out, that's cool, that's happening. A few years ago, they had a big old T20 tournament in Canada, in Canada that was throwing a lot of money around. Like, shout out to any T20 league that has existed for over five years, because you're out here doing it, and I don't know if many of these T20 leagues will exist for over five years. Perhaps the uh, SA20 competition which is south africa's t20 tournament that's being played at the same time as the test series in aotearoa and apparently cricket south africa has guaranteed that its contracted players will put the t20 tournament first as a priority so you might get a second 11 south africa team coming for these tests in aotearoa this summer so we do have the test series against the Auss aussies which will be fantastic unless they're taking the piss as well. And then you've got this uh, South Africa test series. So it's been an interesting morning of uh, Black Caps news. Don't know how this test series against South Africa is going to look. And we've got a very random T20 group in which I've got uh, 22 players have been named for these two series. And I don't think many people will give a shit about it. So big up the Black Caps, and Cricket South Africa. Yeah, particularly Cricket South Africa, because that's a, that's a wild one. Um, especially because that's, like, that's their domestic thing. This isn't like the Black Caps playing Test Cricket while some IPL guys are away, and so you're missing like 10 players. Like Presumably every professional cr cr like cricketer in South Africa is aligned with their domestic t20 league in some extent so is it going to be like when new zealand a plays and they don't they just pick the players who didn't get picked for plunkett shield that week or you know i assume there's some compromise in the middle there where they'll at least get a decent player like the test specialists will be there kind of thing but that's a funky one although i assume 
that's probably for test championship points and i would assume the same of the australian one i don't know what australia's team will be like they know but the thing is those two those are the probably the two nations who trouble the black caps the most when they come and play test matches here like we always lose to australia anyway <laughs> whether it's home or away south africa have beaten us multiple times in test matches at home over the last five or six years which is the most dominant home stretch of black caps test cricket ever like south africa are one of south africa and australia are like the only teams who seem to be able well australia haven't australia haven't been here for a little while i think you know the, i saw a thing on the you know, the last time they played here was when brendan mccullum one of his last test it might have i think it might have been his last test match he smacked a quick hundred or something along those lines um if those are for test championship points and we catch an understrength South Africa team, though, you know, it's not the ideal sporting spectacle that it could have been, but it, you know, it's, it's the Black Caps gain if they're able to get relatively more comfortable results, or a better chance of winning against a bit of a bogey team. You know, that, that, that positive, that's the positive spin on that. They are for World Test Championship points. They are World Test Championship fixtures, so that will be great. Something to keep an eye on, like I think the South Africa 20 League and the Major League uh, T USA T20 tournament super aligned and connected with the uh, IPL ownerships and stuff like that. So if you are right. watching these tournaments, it will be interesting just to track how successful they are because basically the IPL is trying to take over the world as far as T20 cricket goes, and far more interesting cricket than Black Caps random T20 series and international T20 tournaments, apart from Matt Henry and Ish Sodi winning the T20 Blast with Somerset. We do have some uh, Kiwi lads playing county championship cricket. Latest round has just begun. Uh, Doug Bracewell's been in uh, pretty fantastic form for Essex. Tom Latham's lining up for Surrey. Do have Matt Henry backing up for Somerset. Will Young just scored a century, his third winter century in England. No, his third winter in a row playing cricket in England and scoring a century. Three different teams, and I think he's scored four centuries overall. So shout out Will Young. He's playing for Nottinghamshire. And Lancashire have uh, Daryl Mitchell. They've also got Will Williams, former Canterbury seamer, and shout out Matt Quinn. He's playing for Kent. So we still have Kiwis playing county cricket which is good for them. And we also have a first round of NRLW footy. And we've got a few interesting selections. Your Dragons. Your Dragons are going to be a team to watch in the NRLW competition. There's no Paige McGregor, who, is, who has been a fantastic center for the Dragons and Kiwi Ferns. She dropped out of the contract, so she must be dealing with something to drop out of the contract. But... Tyler Nathan Wong is starting in the halves and she's starting in the number six jersey. Gail Broughton, another former rugby union player, sevens player, she's starting in the number six jersey for the Broncos. Both of them are playing alongside really solid halfbacks. Racing McGregor is the Dragons halfback, so you've got two Kiwis there. Racing McGregor, Tyler Nathan Wong. Gail Broughton is playing alongside Ali Brigginshaw, who is a veteran halfback with uh, NRLW championship pedigree. That's great situations for Gail Broughton and Tyler Nathan Wong. Keep in mind, Gail Broughton was fullback for the Eels last season. Now she's moving into the halves with the Broncos. Also, your Dragons have Alexis Tawanii, who I think is a Wainui Amata rugby junior. She is starting lock in her first game of NRLW footy. She was, I think, she was the under-18 Women's Player of the Year in New Zealand Rugby League last year. Then she won the Tasha Gale Cup Player of the Year, I think, playing for the Bulldogs, which I think is like an under-19, under-21 competition. But she was playing in the New South Wales Women's Premiership, which is open grade women's in New South Wales. And she was also the player of the tournament at the National Championship in Australia as a prop so she is basically dominating all footy and now she is starting lock for the dragons at nrlw also have lyshawn albert jones as starting lock for the knights so alexis tawanii she's more of a prop a middle forward 
playing lock. Laishon Albert-Jones has played in the Haas for the Kiwi Ferns before. Now she's starting number 13 for the Knights. So she's got more of that distribution, passing, link, lady style of footy that she will be operating with. So a couple of interesting selections there. Mali Hofunga, she is at centre for the Broncos. Watch out for her. Fantastic uh, World Cup last season. And I also missed uh, Anessa Bidu in all my preview content. So shout out to me. That was a lapse in... Uh, a lapse in mahi that always i don't know that kind of stuff just frustrates the living poo out of me when i miss details like that anessa biddle she is an otara junior she w was playing for otara then she moved over to australia she was playing for the sharks in the new south wales women's premiership now she is starting winger for the sharks in the uh, nrlw that is fantastic and also the raiders the Raiders have four out of their five outside backs are from Aotearoa. Api Nichols at fullback, Madison Bartlett on the wing, and you've got Shayel robbins Retty, who I think was a Black Fern as well. She and Mackenzie Wiki are starting centres. So there's a lot of uh, Aotearoa funk in the first round of NRLW. Tawaniai with the Dragons is a must-watch and... Uh, also, shout out to, yeah, another Black Fern, sorry, Tafito Lafaele. She is on the bench for the Broncos as well. So you've got a lot of Kiwi Ferns veterans. You've got new players. You've got the Black Ferns. You've got the Black Ferns. Sevens players are involved. And you've got some immense young talent in Tawa Niai, uh, Abigail Roach, Mackenzie Wiki, Anessa Biddle. Excellent times on the NRLW beat. Yeah, it's funny how that goes with the um, with the Dragons, where like their men's team is probably the worst in the league for Kiwi NRL players. Like Ben Murdoch Masilla has been there all season; that he's doing some nice things on the edge. I noticed he's not playing this weekend, so I think he might be injured or did you, suspended or something. Um, did you see Paul Turner at fullback? Like, well, he got injured, right? Yeah. Yeah, I was just gonna, I was just gonna say that the Paul Turner era didn't quite. I got excited for that because there was finally a second Kiwi out there getting getting an opportunity. Didn't quite go as liked. I think the Raiders just absolutely bombed him from um from high balls over and over and over, and he was really good under them for the most part. Um, he had one nice line break in the first half, but it was called back for an obstruction. So I guess maybe it wasn't as nice as it looked <laughs> initially, and he didn't quite get the other thing. It's, I didn't notice him being any worse than Tyrell Sloan had been. It just maybe a little less of that running X factor, but um, he finally dropped one about 50 minutes into the game, like a, a high ball under the post. He finally dropped one and a dude came, as he scrambled for the loose ball, a dude came through and like need him in the back and he went off injured and yeah, hasn't been named this week. I don't think Tyrell Sloan's he, back anyway, so I guess he wouldn't have been. But Paul Turner's starting number six for the Dragons in New South Wales Cup. Well, that's all right then. That's just back to what he had been doing. Um, there you go. He, been... he got his one week thing and went off injured early in the second half. So, yeah. you know. shut up, Paul Turner. Um, flying Kiwi Zach Jones. You've over the last six months, I think you've put up like two clips of his uh, saves as a Flying Kiwis goalie, and he is a shot stopper. I think like we've talked a bit about some of the, you know, all whites goalkeeping situation and the depth and style of players and how it relates to Wellington Phoenix goalkeeping. Zach Jones, he saves goals. He keeps the goal. He is a fantastic shot stopper, and I really like Zach Jones for no reason at all other than I, I like his uh, clips that you you whip up, which is always fantastic. Tell us a bit about Zach Jones and the Flying Kiwis at the moment, as well as Logan Rogerson, who also seems to be in fantastic form. Um, yeah, that where the reason those two are lumped together is because they're both playing Europa Conference League qualifiers, first round qualifiers, the start of the new football season. The conference like the Conference League is the third tier European competition. It's only been around for I think this is the third third season it's existed. There's always been at least one New Zealander getting some qualifying minutes. No one's played in the tournament proper yet, but um, you know, early days and we're, we're slowly building up there. 
uh, Zach Jones plays for Haverford West County in Wales. So this is like, you know, the, the top three or four Welsh clubs, um, Swansea and Cardiff, for example, have played Premier League recently. They're part of the English structure. Obviously, Wrexham is in Wales. They've got a bit of a, um, they got a bit of a buzz around them for, for some apparent reason at the, at the moment. Uh, they've just been promoted into League Two. So, you know, this is another example. There's a couple other as well. Like the top Welsh clubs will play in the English League format. So the Welsh League itself is not as strong. And outside of the top couple teams, like, for example, Greg Draper played there for a long time, ex-Wellington Phoenix striker. He's sort of moved on now. But um, he played at uh, the New Saints there, who were just winning the league title every year. So that was, that's a little bit of a different thing. Zach Jones at Haverford West County, a kind of underdog team. They're an underdog team in an underdog league. So double underdog status. He... Um, he went over there after he left the Wellington Phoenix. No, he left the Wellington Phoenix and then played for, um, oh, Christ, was it Miramar Rangers or Wellington Olympic? Uh, I think it might have been, well, you, you know, one of, the, one of the two of them. He was playing club football in Wellington. I think it was um, Miramar. I think it might have been Miramar. I'd have did, to look that up. I did um, look on his um, transfer market profile, and he did have Miramar there off the top of my head. Yeah, we also had Scotty Hales in the Twitter mentions, ex Miramar coach, mentioning, um, you know, talking him up there. So, um, yeah, he was Wellington Phoenix Academy goalkeeper for a couple of years. He did get as far as, pretty sure he got as close as getting on the bench a couple of times uh, for the A League team, but he never played an A League game or anything. He never, had, I don't think he actually played a senior game for the club at all. Left and played some club football, then went over to Wales, was playing there, and last season just had this nuts um, thing where he was like, they they dropped into the second half, the bottom half of the competition, and then at the second, like the last few rounds, is they split it top half and second half, so championship rounds, relegation rounds. So they're battling to avoid relegation, and all of a sudden they just went on the streak, and he was keeping clean sheets, and it was like they found this form they'd never show. Obviously, they're playing against other relegation threatened teams. So the schedules were a bit easy, but they found this consistency, this form they, they hadn't had before. They finished top of the relegation rounds. Because they finished top of the relegation rounds, they get the last spot along with, I think, three other teams from the top things into competing for the last available conference league qualifying spot. And then they went and won that too. And he, Zach Jones, was a bit of a hero throughout that because he was a penalty shootout um, in which he saved a couple penalties. And you know, this was the first thing, a highlight clip from a few months back. And on the back of that being maybe the star of them qualifying for Europe for, I think, I don't think it's the first time, but it's like the first time in quite a long time that club had had anything like this. He gets a one-year extension, stays around. Those conference league qualifiers finally came around this past week. They're playing a team called Shindia, Shindia, something like that from, I think, Macedonia. And this is a professional team they're up against. They're basically a semi-pro team. So there's already like big underdog stuff again, like underdog on top of underdog on top of that's now triple underdog status, you know, and they lost one nil, but he made a bunch of saves, kept them in the game against, this was away from home as well. So they've got the second leg on Friday morning. It's live streamed on the Heaven for West County's YouTube thing. So if he gets some more highlights, I can chuck up another one, um, get some more Zach Jones highlight clips out there from that. And yeah, I don't know if they'll go through. I don't know if the advance will definitely not be the favorites, but they've kept themselves in with a, the chance of doing so, thanks largely to Zach Jones's making a bunch of impressive saves and goal, as he seems to do quite often. He's only 22, I would guess, about 22 years old, which is young for a goalkeeper. And you get this kind of, you get a few highlight clips like this. You can bounce this at the end of this season. There'll be opportunities somewhere else, maybe goes to England or, or whatever. Like you, you can, it's, it's a nice trajectory. He's definitely playing at a relatively low level at the moment to consider compared to other professional leagues, but it's the kind of stuff that'll get you noticed. And Logan Rogerson for FC Haka in Finland, similar thing in that they just went on a, just a big run to they didn't have to go through like knockout qualifying qualifying <laughs> they didn't have to qualify for qualifiers but they just they just got there on the back of their league play they finished third or fourth or something i don't know what it was in finland just playing some good footy rogerson's been getting a lot of assists playing quite regularly there on the right wing they've actually been quite crap this year uh fc haka they've been losing a lot of games that 
last year they were getting stuff out of um Rogerson's had a couple you know a goal or two and a couple of nice assists and moments like this but um they weren't in very good form coming up to their conference league first leg against a club called Crusaders from uh Northern Ireland so this was at home they drew two all they conceded early, but they took a 2-1 lead and then ended up drawing after they got a red card in the second half, played, had to play the last 25 minutes. The 10 men conceded, but held on still for a draw, which is all right. It's a, you know even, even Stevens going into the second league, even if it is away from home. First goal they scored, penalty scored by Logan, Logan Rogerson. So um, carrying on the form that we saw from uh, Max Mata in this competition last year and qualifies. He scored a couple goals for Sligo Rovers when they were in it. They aren't in it this year because they didn't do well enough in their league last season. But um, him and Nando Panica played in qualifiers. Actually, before the year before that, Sligo Rovers were in it again when Ryan DeVries was still playing there. So he played in qualifiers there as well. Uh, Joe Bell played some Europa Conference League stuff with Bromby last year. And Chuck and Rogerson, Chuck and Zach Jones, Ollie White is also at FC Hacker, but he was an unused sub in the first leg. So hopefully, because the central midfielder did get sent off, you know, this is going to be at least some reshuffling. So hopefully he gets a go in the second leg and can add to that list. Um, there might be someone else I've forgotten, but I don't think so. I can't remember. Um yeah, it's like it's a lower stakes stuff, the conference league. It's not it's not the Champions League. It's not the Europa League. It's the Conference League below that. But the reason it exists is to give clubs like these clubs from smaller countries that wouldn't, that aren't ever going to qualify for the Champions League group stage and get to play against Barcelona or Man City or whatever. It's to give them a competition to challenge for. And that's exactly what we've got here. Like it's the you know, third or fourth best team in Finland and the fifth or sixth best team in Wales, you know, trying to, trying to get things in and, Logan Rogerson has played all whites football fair bit. Um, Zach Jones hasn't, Ollie White hasn't, but these are guys who, again, are young enough that they're pushing up towards that kind of thing in the future. So it's a funky little underdog story to to follow um, the, the conference league stuff with a couple Kiwis doing excellent things, in particular Zach Jones there. And yeah, we'll see how far they go. Though both the Rogerson's second leg as well is also Hucker's second leg. Rogerson and White's second leg is on Friday morning as well. So we'll see. We'll see. They might even you know might even have that in the email. Another thing that might find its way into the Substack. Do FC Hucker have to apologise for appropriating? <laughs> um, I I think it's just a, a word that is also a Finnish word. I I don't. <laughs> No, for certain, but um, it is kind of appropriate that they have two Kiwi lads in their in their squad, though. That and they're called Haka. You know, it's a nice bit of um, synchronicity. The football fans start the World Cup tonight against Norway, and they we have a lot of information content about the football fans. We've talked about the football fans throughout our podcasting history. You can go back and you can actually absorb analysis about how the football fans play their footy as opposed to just whinging about a lack of goals and um, anything else you can find to complain about like we are here as we're here with all Kiwi sports to tell you what's actually happening to get into the nitty-gritty how they operate how they play realistic expectations and whatnot that is to say we've got a lot of football fans information already out in the universe written information, podcast information, clips, social media information, flying Kiwis information to learn about these players even further and what they actually do around the world consistently. Ahead of this game against Norway, which is tonight, Thursday, I've got a few questions just to help explain some of this game. And I'm going to start in your, uh, you've done a fantastic job here. You've done a You've scouted the group stage opponents for the football ferns, starting with Norway. And you've got one paragraph here uh, that says, the problem with Norway is that their undeniably stacked squad is mostly stacked in attacking areas, which has left them with no worries scoring goals, but several worries in preventing them when they meet those top level nations. Obviously, Aotearoa is a top-level sporting nation in the world, the best sporting nation in the world, KG for KG. So I'm curious if you, and I've got a, lot, I've got a few questions here, so you don't need to go deep into this, but do you think 
the football ferns can challenge Norway's defence? Can they challenge them? I I think so. I mean, it's they're, yeah, they're not a team that scores many goals. They're not a team that creates many chances. Like Their finishing isn't great, but also they don't create enough chances to be good at, at finishing anyway. So it's like a double banger um, issue. Norway, like, I... I see the thing there are less about the football phones have an opportunity to score a, a few goals against a potentially um, weak in Norway. As um, I see that less as the situation and more that Norway know that they have to be a bit more cautious in terms of just not leaning all in on their attacking players like Ada Hedgerberg and um, uh, so I can't re remember how to pronounce her name, but the um, Anna Maria, what's her name, who plays for Barcelona and Caroline Grant Hansen and you know players like this are extremely extremely good. Um, it's like you know, um, in Give fact, I think Anna Maria, what's her name, might be the Switzerland player. I think I think I'm merging those things. I remember when I put the when I put the picture together from the thing and like realized all these three teams were red and everything looks the same and um, merges together. But football um, fans attacking Norway defense. What you got? Well, yeah, what I'm saying is that I think I think it's less that the football ferns have, um, you know, a weakness to exploit than it is that I think Norway hopefully will be overcorrecting defensively and maybe taking some um, efforts away from their... Because the thing is with them is they went to the last Euros with some expectations and lost 8-0 to England in the group stage. That was a bit of a shocking thing for them. They realized they can't just roll up and play like loose footy they need to be quite sturdy in defense and so i'm hoping that what we get is that kind of thing where they're like can the football ferns threaten them hopefully hopefully they can score a goal or two more likely i don't you know if one is much more likely than two i don't think we can be that lucky but if they can scrape something hopefully it's the kind of game where norway you know um because they're focused on defending, we might be able to scrape a, a one nil or a, more likely a one all kind of situation. You know, what it is a bit of a freebie result, though. What formation are you expecting the football fans to play with? I would highly expect the four three three we saw against Vietnam. I don't think you change it at that point unless you're intending to take it into the tournament. So, um, yeah, one one central defensive midfielder, which will be probably Malia Steinmetz, and then you'll have Rhea Percival with someone else. Maybe it was Betsy Hassett in that game. Um, we'll see how it goes, because I live chances dealing with a knee injury. Anneli Longo is coming back from a long-term thing. It sounds like maybe they might be players that are preferred off the bench, or at least won't be starting all three games, in which case you probably want to prioritize the Philippines game as the most winnable one. So uh, we'll see how that goes. But yeah, the... The four three three with the CDM and the two sort of more free roaming midfielders in front, and then a, you know two wingers and a striker up top. So that's a more attacking formation theme of the podcast, aligned with maybe Norway are more worried about their defense than their attack. So you, that, that's how the football fans are going to win. Uh, okay, who is or who are the classy football fans? Who you just enjoy watch and play footy? Classy. Um, that the we problem should with be the word like in with. Yeah. The, the problem with the word like classy is you think of like silky midfieldy kite passes, and we don't really have any of those. But um, class comes in many different shapes and forms, and yeah. Rhea Percival certainly carries a lot of that as someone who's going to press a lot from midfield, win a lot of ball, just knock knock it around nice and safe when she gets it, but that's all you got to do in that role. Yeah, um, I think CJ Bott um, does the same thing at right back. You know? Yeah, I see what you mean about classy. Like they're, they're, they're more of a, uh, you said sturdy. They're like classy, ruthless. Classy, yeah. classy Kiwis, because we do know the Kiwi style of football is a bit more physical, is a bit more robust as we say and i think Rhea percival and cj bot they've got that class to their physical mahi yeah i'd add vic Hessen as goalkeeper as well in that um in that category and i think maybe someone who probably does touch more upon the more traditional sense of the classiness would be rebecca stott as like a 
a ball playing center back who's not just a ball playing center back but also like um her trademark move is just you know step up intercept the ball and keep going you know carry the ball all the way and she's played a lot of midfield she knows how to do that she'll just dribble it up into midfield create that overload ideally you know that works even better actually when you have a central defensive midfielder so you know if she does that Steinmetz will drop in cover for her and stock carries up and drags someone else out and you know as i say create that overload find that extra thing that's something she's extremely good at and hopefully we'll get at least some opportunities to do that against a very good norway team who's likely to dominate possession so hopefully so i think yeah rebecca stott she's going to score the winning goal football fans are going to defeat norway who is a sneaky football ferns player that you're interested in for this norway game and by sneaky i mean a player who's going to play a fair amount of minutes against norway but isn't a leading figure in the football ferns team well i think the i'm not entirely sure on what the front three will be because as i say live chance might just come back in and start and play 90 minutes and say you know the knee's fine i can handle it kind of thing um, if that's the case, then it depends. But at least one of, based on what we've seen from the um, from the very recent friendly games, the Vietnam game in particular, at least one of Jackie Hand and Indy Riley will be starting on the other wing, if not both of them starting on each wing. It's definitely them. Like they're the sneaky ones. They're young players. They're new to the squad, and they play in those attacking areas where the Ferns clearly lack a lot of sort of flair and creativity and these are the players that they're leaning on in order to find some of that and they're not you know it's not going to be the same rampant athleticism you're going to get from the the english team or the um or the american team or whatever but the sneaky good players particularly in that like as wide players in a 4-3-3 i think that formation suits both of them but especially indy riley extremely well like that's the ideal spot to be putting them in um and yeah it will be sneaky if they can supply some creativity because they are young players in the squad they are inexperienced players in the squad but that's all we have to choose from with the exception of hannah wilkinson and Liv chance in the front three like they're two very experienced players who are leaders in the group everyone else in the attack in three is just going to be in that sneaky young inexperienced mold and jackie hand has certainly put herself above the rest of the pack as a likely starter. Indy Riley seems to be making that case over the course of the, the training camp and the Vietnam game. I thought she was excellent. By far the best she's played in a football ferns jersey. They're the ones. Like that that's where it's coming from. Is uh India Paige Riley, is she the fastest football fan? No, Paige Satchel's the fastest football fan for sure. Um See, I, yeah, I don't know. We don't, we're not blessed with pace across the across the board. But um, Paige Satchel is absolute lightning. But the style of player that she is, she's someone who you kind of want to be. You you don't necessarily lean on her to start. You kind of want to chuck her on for 10, 15 minutes at the end and try bring some chaos to the game when defenders are already tired, sort of thing. Sounds a lot about like what you were saying about the All Whites and having the different types of yeah. players to impact a game around 60, 70 minutes and really challenge the op opposition, which in this case, as I said, Norway, they're going to be worried about their defense. Rebecca Stott's going to get an interception, stroll forward, put a ball into space to Riley. She's going to whip it across. Wilkinson gets the winning goal. Bang. Done. Done. Sorted. That's the, that's the formula right there. It's, don't even need to watch the game now still will though and like 75 minutes of just brutal kiwi defense at the uh garden of eden yeah well the last world cup we played against netherlands in the first game it was 90 minutes of brutal defense i barely had a shot what they did was from long range just locked them in defensively and then conceded in the 90th minute and lost one nil in norway went on to lose in the grand final so it was a tough one but it kind of spoiled the momentum of the tournament so you know the, the old 90 minute performances they count they matter the Aotearoa Warriors have a game on Friday night against the Canberra Raiders, who they defeated a few weeks ago in Canberra for Jared Croker's 300th game. And interestingly, I think the Raiders have won all three games since then. They had a win over the Roosters. They had a win over the Titans. They had a win over your Dragons. They certainly did. <laughs> and now they face the Warriors. 
since the Warriors defeated the uh, Raiders, they have played four games. They've had three wins, and they have scored 40-plus points in all three wins. Obviously, they lost to the Rabbitohs, while the Raiders, they have scored over 30 points in just one of those games against your Dragons because the Dragons kind of suck. In fact... You could make a case that all three teams that the Raiders have played since losing to the Warriors also suck. The Titans aren't very good. The Roosters aren't very good right now. And, of course, your Dragons aren't very good. So this is a very interesting game for the Warriors because I think, obviously, the Raiders are going to be uh, fizzing for this encounter to come back against the Warriors. And I've got a few notes here but i want to get your your thoughts on a matter that i've been thinking deeply about no surprises really considering i wrote about rocco berry last week he had his breakout performance against the sharks and then we've had a lot of there's been a lot of rocco berry buzz over the last few days and i i went into debt into some depth about this on on the uh the preview for the raiders game on our website the newsdashcase.com so you can read about it there but quite simply I just want to catch your catch your vibe here. Who do you think is an easier matchup? Matthew Tomoko or Jared Croker? Interesting. Um Well I mean I I don't I don't know if you watched the um the, the Raiders versus Dragons game, but Tomoko in the first half of that game was unbelievable like it was his running game in particular was so good he destroyed the like he was the best player on the park i'm not exaggerating that the second half he eased off a little bit because the game swung back a little bit more because the raiders didn't punish the dragons as they should have until the last minute when they ran through but you know i mean croker's you know it's a legend of the game but tomoko is the dude who's coming up into towards his prime right now and i've you know you buy stocks now because they're only going to be rising so you think matthew tomoko is a tougher matchup is that what you're I saying i think if you're gonna have to try tackle him yeah i, I, yeah, was, right. I think so yeah yeah just say it say it with your chest you know matthew tomoko is the best center in the nrl uh one of the best oh, uh, Aotearoa the kiwis chest. players <laughs> And well, he's yet to play for the Aotearoa Kiwis, soon to be Aotearoa Kiwis centre Matthew Tomoko, and he is a far harder matchup than Jared Croker. Like that is based purely on vibe, but if you want to get into some stats, we can get into some stats because Matthew Tomoko four four point five tackle bus per game, Jared Croker one point four, Matthew Tomoko one hundred sixty three meters per game, Jared Croker seventy one. Matthew Tomoko, 1.6 missed tackles per game. Jared Croker, 3 missed tackles per game. So those are the stats. And you don't even need the stats. Like you just watch footy. Matthew Tomoko is an absolute monster at center. So guess who Rocco Berry's lining up against this weekend? Huh. <laughs> Especially interesting after you highlighted on the... Um... Uh, well, and you read and a couple times, and you read the thing in particular about how Barry had his great game targeting a notably weak edge from the Sharks, and now you're coming up against one of the best centers in the league. No, he's coming up against Croker. Okay, sorry, <laughs> I misread what you're saying. So, Rocco, in Barry, that case, it's just going to be the same as the Sharks again, isn't it? So, for like this is, I only. Stolen. I've only really tapped in with this because of the Sharks' performance. I don't, I haven't gone too deep into Rocco Berry's whole season, but these two games, Rocco Berry, uh, it's hard to say a far easier matchup. But when you look like Jesse Ramian, he hits and sticks. Britton Nakora is the best hole running edge forward in the NRL, but he is a fantastic defensive edge forward as well. Uh, we've got all the stats on the Sharks' edge defense. Guess what happened this week? Matt Moylan dropped. Talakai to the bench. That's how good they have been traveling. So Rocco Berry, for two weeks in a row, he's coming up against a easier matchup than Adam Pompey. Like, Ramian's a better defender than Talakai, and he's in better form. He's got more confidence. And 
Adam Pompey went up against him. Also, the, you had Nakora there on that edge as well. This week, it's Adam Pompey versus Matthew Tomoko and Rocco Berry against Jared Croker. Guess what happened when Ali Liatawa made his NRL debut against the Raiders? He was marking up against Jared Croker, and Liatawa looked pretty good. Now, Liatawa's always looking pretty good. But I think he also looked pretty good because he was coming up against Croker. So if you were riding high on Rocco Berry buzz after that Sharks game, he's got an easier matchup again for this week against the Raiders. You know, obviously there's a whole lot of other stuff that matters in a game of rugby league. But I do find it interesting, like, because you, if you compare opinion about Rocco Berry and Adam Pompey, right now they are at, you know, opposite ends of the spectrum. But Berry's benefiting from better matchups. And Pompey's doing his job. You can get into some defensive stats, but I think the Sharks' right edge from last week, they were far more challenging than the Sharks' left edge. So Jackson Ford missed tackles. Luke Metcalf missed tackles. I think they missed five tackles each. Adam Pompey missed a few. He might have missed eight. But that's because the Sharks' right edge is so much better than their left edge with an attack and defense. And I think it's, uh, it's a bit trickier with the Raiders, because there's uh, obviously edge forward and the halves, but just straight up center matchup, second week in a row, Rocco Berry looks likely to have the better matchup. And that'll be interesting to see what happens there. Jack Whiten's going to be defending on the left edge for the Raiders against Rocco Berry, so that will be interesting. He's a good defender. like He loves to whack in defense as well. However... The Raiders have three players in the top 50 for missed tackles. And they're all edge defenders. Two of them, Elliot Whitehead is 13th, Hudson Young is 19th. They are your edge forwards. So what we're talking about on the variety show, the Warriors attacking space. You might want to be attacking that space. But we also saw when the Warriors played the Raiders in Canberra, they were attacking the middle spaces a lot because the Raiders' forward pack can be a bit slow, can be a bit clunky. And I think that's another area of the where the Warriors can really target. But again, we're talking about the Warriors here, so they're attacking every space. And they're challenging those middle forwards. Then they'll be challenging the edge defense as well. Jack Whiten is also 28th for missed tackles. The Warriors have one player in the top 50 for missed tackles, and that's Jackson Ford. Which... I think it's just because he plays. Wonder where he learned that. <laughs> yeah, well, he's also he playing with the tackles. He's also playing 80, 80 minutes every game in a pretty hard defensive spot, and he's like, you know, Luke Metcalf isn't a great defender. So you got to like there's and and he's had a different. I think the most changes happened on that left edge with uh, Tamari Martin, then Dylan Walker, then Luke Metcalf yeah. as well. So it's just been. Uh, it's been an interesting week for the Rocco Berry hype and like Rocco Berry is a fantastic player. He was recruited by both codes coming out of high school, playing first 15 for St. Pat Silverstream in Wellington. Both codes were hunting him. The Warriors won it. There was a lot of uh, media hype around signing Rocco Berry. The Warriors played a game in Wellington and they were like, Rocco Berry, come along, chill out with Roger Tuivasa-Shek, all this stuff. They recruited him hard. Rocco Berry's really good at footy. He also came up against the Sharks' edge that is now dropped. And he's not playing up. He's not playing against Matthew Tomoko this week. He's playing up against Jared Croker. So just keep that in mind as we're rolling through this uh, Rocco Berry hype situation. Because I, I like Pompey. Pompey's pretty good. And especially when you think about the job of the center for the Warriors is to pass the footy. And I think Pompey's pretty good at that. Rocco Berry's pretty good at that. They do their jobs. I think they're both pretty good overall. Uh, I've got a few more notes. One I'm interested in about Sean's Nickel Crookstar. And this goes back to one of the... Um, well, not... One of there's a quite a few similarities between the Panthers and the Warriors that we've discussed all season. One of them, I think, is Nickel Clockstar and Dylan Edwards. Because when the Panthers play, it's Dylan Edwards around the footy, 
like Dylan Edwards has taken two runs a set. Sean's local clock star has taken two runs a set. When they get down the uh, near the try line, Nickel Clockstar and Dylan Edwards, they both move to the right. You don't really see Nickel Clockstar on the left. He's always on the right side sweeping around the back. Then you go on the left. For the Panthers, it's Jerome Luai. For the Warriors, it's Luke Metcalf. And then Sean Johnson plays uh, inside both of those players, either side of the ruck. So it's basically Sean Johnson's in the middle zone. Then you've got Nickel Clockstar stretching out to the right. You've got Luke Metcalf stretching out on the left. As the Panthers play a lot with uh, Isaiah Yo, Nathan Cleary, then Dylan Edwards. Isaiah Yo, Nathan Cleary, and Jerome Luai. Nickel Clockstar scored his try against the Raiders on the right edge. And then a lot of the um, fantastic work on the right edge against the Sharks also featured a lot of Nickel Clockstar and I'm just going. I'm curious how he's going to perform against the Raiders, especially if the Raiders, they they should know all about Nickel Clockstar, right? Like he played for the Raiders. He was, he was a grand final fullback, so they should know about his game. And I'm curious to see what they do to limit him, especially when Nickel Clockstar is running the footy. Because I think the Sharks did that pretty well, limiting his his meters running the footy. Um, then again, the Sharks did a pretty good job of uh, limiting everyone's meters in the first 20 minutes. Like uh, Tom Alley averaged like five meters a run or something crazy. Let me pull it up here. He had six runs for yeah, 35 meters. Six, 5.85 because we talked about it on the other yeah. show, yeah. 5.8 meters per run. Last time Tom Alley played against the Raiders, he scored a try, I think. And he also had seven runs for 83 meters. So 11.8 meters per run. We, I use the uh, meters per run stat a lot. And that is a clear example of how useful it is. Against the Sharks, Tom Alley averaged 5.8 meters per run. Last time he played against the Raiders, he averaged 11.8. Basically double. And that... Slightly more than double. Yeah, and thinking back to it, I think that is... Like Tom Alley shined in that game because he was quick. He was he had footwork. He was mobile and powerful. I don't know if that works so much against the Sharks because the Sharks, they've got a lot of nuggety defenders there led by Cameron McInnes against the Warriors last weekend. But against the Raiders, those type of players sneaking into gaps and getting between Papali'i and Tapani and Horsburgh and challenging those spaces also with the passing shape around them i think that's designed for ale as well which is interesting because that's effectively matchup chat again it's the same as what you're saying about the sensors and you know um rocco berry is clearly a very good player but also don't get carried away considering the matchup but then at the same time if you're saying that it's, it's also saying don't get carried away in the opposite direction on adam pompey because he's having tougher matchup like it is kind of a um and then tom alley you know the sharks do one thing the raiders do another thing his stats reflect that he's the same player you know he he's not a guy who averages 5.8 meters per run against everyone kind of thing it's a uh, it's a nice lesson in in, in taking into consideration the opposition as well as just what the player does one week, next week, week after kind of thing. It's a, a good context there from you. Good context. I like it. It's it's aided by these like two games against opponents. Yeah. Because like we've seen the Warriors against the Bulldogs, the Warriors just put blokes through holes in the middle. It's like, well, the Bulldogs can't stop the Warriors in the middle zone. How are they going to stop them on the edges? The Cowboys one is a bit harder to read because the Cowboys seem to be good now. I don't know how good they are, but they're better now than when the Warriors played against them. So that's tricky. The Warriors lost both games against the Roosters early in the season. And the Roosters aren't winning at the moment. So you in those games, you can kind of get trends and you can kind of see how teams are playing. And... I'm reminded that, like, I just, like, the Raiders, 
when you think back to the tries the Warriors scored against the Raiders and how I was talking about that performance, it was stretch them out, then attack the space in the middle. Whereas I think, I don't, like, who knows if this is true, this is just my interpretation. Against the Sharks, it was all about condensing them in the middle and then stretching them out and attacking the space out wider. Because like when Wagen e Egan's getting out of dummy half, he's drawing in two defenders into him, then he's passing out the back. Whereas against the Raiders, like the Warrior, Sean Johnson put Luke Metcalf over when Johnson got concussed. Um, well, not official concussion because he came back. But... Yeah, because he came back and scored a try. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's the tactic. Just off the kickoff, you need to rush up. Oh, I don't know. Um, Tom Alley got put over in the middle. Luke Metcalf got, got put over in the middle. Just seemed like they were able to really isolate the spaces around those middle forwards of the Raiders and hopefully they'll be able to attack those spaces again this week. All of this late, so we're talking about the Warriors attacking the Sharks to the left edge, which means the Warriors right edge. Well, Nia Corey wasn't playing that game. And he's an absolute monster at right edge forward and he is straight back into the Warriors team this week. He's uh he's starting edge forward on the right, Jackson Ford on the left. Like if Rocco Berry was good last week, well, this week he's going to have Maratini Okori running those hard, hard lines. And basically it's like, Sean Johnson, he can either pass to Neil Okori or he can pass to Nickel Clockstar or Berry. And if Neil Okori catches the ball, you need to get a body in front of him because he's gone straight through. You probably need to get two bodies on him. And if you get two bodies on him, space out wide, easy mahi. So... Um, I think Nia Corey is a better edge forward than Mitchell Barnett, but I love Mitchell Barnett. Holy cow. He's just good. He's like, he can do a job on the edge, but he also can dominate as a middle forward, like physically and just his involvement. And he's playing big minutes. I Mitchell Barnett 60 minutes. And I had this in the, uh, in the written preview. Mitchell Barnett, 60 minutes. Toe Harris, 67 minutes. Fanua Blake, 58 minutes. Dylan Walker, 59 minutes. Let alone the edge forwards, Neil Corey and Jackson Ford, obviously getting big minutes because they play most of the game anyway. That's why you can... Like you look at this bench, no Bailey Sirenin, no Josh Curran. So you've got two little blokes, and uh, Dylan Walker's kind of big. You got Dylan Walker and Freddie Lussick on the bench. And obviously Dylan Walker, he plays big minutes. Mitchell Barnett plays big minutes. So two of your bench forwards are playing big minutes. You don't really need to carry those other forwards. Like Bailey Sirenin's been good. Josh Curran's pretty good. They've they could be start, they could be top 17 players at a lot of other NRL teams. But the way Andrew Webster's operating with his forward pack. Mitchell Barnett's going to come off the bench maybe 25 minutes in and he might play the rest of the game. Like that's just what he does. He plays big minutes and we know Dylan Walker 20 minutes in, he's coming off he's coming off the bench for our forward. It will be interesting to see that rotation because if Dylan Walker comes on for Bunty our forward, then Barnett he's either coming on for Fenua Blake and Harris but they're playing big minutes so just keep an eye on how Mitchell Barnett is used and obviously Tom Alley. Like, uh, just the, thinking back to my Ford pack preview, I had Bunty Afo and Tom Alley as runners and then I had like Barnett near Corey Walker as versatile forwards who can play different positions. That's crystal clear now. Bunty Afo starts and then you've got Tom Alley playing that role as well off the bench. And they don't do what Dylan Walker does. And Dylan Walker doesn't do what Mitchell Barnett does. So they all have complementary skill sets and play different roles in the same forward pack. Which is pretty handy because I assume Toe Harris has been named day. Eh? Um I assume he's playing right because even, even though he's had a couple games recently where he seems to have you know spent longer on the bench, usually with an injury concern. He seems to be strapped up like um, 
uh, I was going to say Nosferatu. That's the wrong one, isn't it? And Nosferatu was a vampire. Um, whatever, old Boris Karloff or whatever. Um, the Mummy. He seems, yeah, like his, his knees very heavily strapped up quite a lot. He seems to be, have, I think it was his hand last week, wasn't it? Was injured, but he always keeps coming back. Like even when they're when they're winning, and it's like you don't need to. It's like the Johnson Raiders game where it's like you, you took a head knock. You don't need to come back in, but he does and scores a try. Um, Toto Harris is clearly just an absolute trooper. Uh, but it's helpful to have versatile players around when you at this stage of the season when you do need to be a little bit more mindful of that because you are getting closer to that finals footy, which the Warriors are going to make at, at this point, at this like at this rate, and likely going to get a home semi final at some point as well in there because I I think that's how the format works. I, was, I meant yeah, to double check this, but I think I think you got to be top four, and who know, like. Who would have thunk it? Mm. Home advantage might help, you know, like in the NRL playing yeah, at home you know? kind of helps. And everyone wondered why the Warriors sucked during the pandemic. I don't know. Maybe home field advantage matters. Toe Harris, I think they were taking the piss last week. In the nicest yeah, possible. Well, fair enough. I yeah. think they <laughs> just didn't need to play Toe Harris, you know, it's like convenient. Mm because he plays a lot of minutes every week. So when you can rest him for a stint, you take those opportunities. And yeah, it's more insulting to the Sharks. Like, yeah, <laughs> you don't need Toe Harris to beat you. Yeah, he's um, playing through it against the Panthers. And like, you got to think, like the Warriors were able to shift the footy without Toe Harris, right? So they have different ways they can shift the footy because earlier in the season, it was a lot of, that was me celebrating Toe Harris as the distribution point but the Warriors also looked excellent shifting the footy without Toe Harris now, and they've developed that skill set in other players. Prior to that game, there is a New South Wales Cup game, and the one thing you need to know about this game, I don't know if they are both 17-year-olds right now, but Salomiela Halasima, Leka Halasima, and he is a he's in the Warriors forward pack. We've talked about him all season, mentioned him on the variety show, scored an excellent try last weekend. The Raiders also have Chevy Stewart as their fullback, and he's 17 years old as well. So this game will have two of the youngest New South Wales Cup players coming up against each other. Hullasim is a forward, and he's a he's a physical specimen for sure, but he's not massive like he's not a ginormous or overly fast or anything he's just like a fantastic footy player chevy stewart is smaller which is makes his like he's a fullback and he's a quick fullback so his mahi is pretty excellent as well considering you assume the younger player is some sort of physical freak to be playing against men reserve grade footy as a 17 year old you got to offer something freaky and i think chevy stewart for the raiders that is more as his speed and instincts halasima everything so <laughs> shout out to him shout out and shout out to two 17 year olds playing new south wales cup that is absolutely bonkers let's crack into some nbl for you let's finish with nbl finals it's a bit of a it's a bit of a chaotic scene here with the NBL Finals, just for trying to figure out what's happening. Tonight, we have Canterbury Rams versus Hawks Bay Hawks and Franklin Bulls versus Wellington Saints. I assume, I wasn't really listening to you break it down on the uh, variety show. <laughs> you can go was, listen back if you want. The podcast probably, is there. I was probably trying to figure out my own shit I was trying to say. Um but the Tuatara and Otago Nuggets are already in yep. finals. So I would assume that the winners from this game, they play the Tuatara yeah, so or the, the Nuggets. The lowest, then... yeah, the, the highest ranked seed of the winners. So, for example, if Canterbury wins, they're the third seed. So no one can be a higher seed than that. If they win, they will play Otago. Like the, so the highest ranked advancing team plays... Otago is the lowest ranked semi finalist, and Tortara will play the lowest ranked advancing team, which would definitely be the Hawks if they advance, or if there's an upset there. It depends on how that 
um, in the other game, then it depends on how that goes. And uh, frankly, I I will just say, wouldn't put it past upsets in both these games. I think the Hawks and Saints are the types of teams that have been super inconsistent, super frustrating for a lot of the season, also might just completely turn it on in a finals game and topple like Canterbury or Franklin. I think Canterbury in particular might be a little bit vulnerable, just the way they've been tracked and they've not been quite as dominant as they were at the start of the season. This is how they are now, but I'm just saying that, you know, I think there's definitely upset potential. Having said that, I think that's upset potential in this round. I still think the Tortara will win the whole thing. And Rob Lowe won the uh, MVP award, didn't he? So big up to him as a Tortara. As he absolutely should have been. And I think that he might have even won the, I think he won the defensive player of the year as well on top of that. So, you know, <laughs> the MVP in every way, shape and form. That's it, it, If it wasn't unanimous, it should have been unanimous. There was also some news about Sam Timmons. He signed with the Sydney Kings and he plays for the Otago Nuggets. So he has been fantastic for the Otago Nuggets. So watch out for him. Uh, he's a, basically a centre who is off to the Sydney Kings next season which is a great move for him. Any, like whether you want to drop some notes on these games tonight or just grand, because uh, the next finals games, the Tuatara game is Friday, the Otago game is Saturday, and then the grand finals Sunday. So I'm not sure where you want to center your observations in that finals mix, but drop some info, drop some notes, drop some nugs. Well, I wouldn't mind <laughs> nugs. Um, wouldn't mind dropping a nug on the Nuggets then. In that case, with that Sam Timmons thing, because just just to mention that, like he he has had an excellent season. Particularly, he's been really good defensively for the Otago Nuggets, who at the start of the year were the best defensive team going around. That did change a little bit. Um, they, they sort of you know lost a little bit of form there for a while and. I think the Tortata ended up averaging fewer points per game allowed over the course of the full course of the season. But the way the Nuggets started was definitely all in on that. And Timmons has been great. He rebounds. He can. He's got a you know increasingly decent touch at the rim as well, and, and being able to score. Um, and you know he, they the the Breakers signed him two years ago, I think, as a DP, and then they elevated him to the or it might have been. Might have been there for three years. I can't remember. They elevated him to the full roster. He was a fully rostered player last year, but he hardly played. They barely used him. Um, they were a good team that year, so it's a it's a bit of a different thing to how it had been in previous years. Like they they were a winning team, so they had a full formula. They knew what worked, and Timmons was sort of like you know just called upon in in case of late the garbage time minutes and maybe if someone gets injured, kind of thing. So that's how it goes. They didn't re-sign him for that reason because why would you re-sign a player you barely use? Sydney Kings is a great spot for him to end up, though, because for, for one thing, you're going from the beaten uh, finalist to the team that won the whole thing. That's nice. That's, that's a nice little... That's the only team he could have gone to that's better than what the Breakers just achieved. I assume if you're poaching a dude in free agency, you probably are leaning on the idea then that... Um, you have a role for him. You have some kind of, you know, uh, vision for how you're going to use this guy and actually give him some minutes, which I guess the breakers don't, didn't, even though they back up center, they just signed Dane Pino, who I don't, he's probably better than Timmons, but I don't think he's that much better than Timmons to, to make that make a whole lot of sense. It was just kind of a strange one. Um, because they have changed their center rotation a little bit, because obviously Rob Lowe's retired, and they've gone away from the Derek Pardon type thing, who's a bit of an undersized, but like really versatile, switchable kind of defender. They've gone towards um, uh, Mangog Matiang and Dame Pino, which is very much like just two traditional tall rebounding centers. It's like, well, that's what some Sam Simmons already does. You know, you could have just kept him, but... Um, the fact that he's popped up on a team that's recruited him and tried to sign him, I think is quite an exciting thing. And also this is coming after the Breakers did bring back um, uh, Finn Delaney, which takes us up to 19 contracted players, New Zealanders in the Australian League next year. 
I think the record for minutes is 20, which has happened twice. I can't remember, but I wrote about it in that um, in that piece where I just like picked a player from each team who could add to that thing, who could add to that mix. That is, you know, a lot of teams are pretty close to finishing their rosters, but injuries happen. Injury replacement players are then signed. Development player roster spots are still available, including for the breakers. We could very easily get to 20 and beyond. I mean, Tom Vodanovich might come back mid-season. There's talk of that, you know. Um, once he's done with his Philippine stuff, very good chance we hit that record this season. And that is... Pretty, you know, it's pretty exciting. It's one of them things I've been trying to keep a focus on. It's just the Sydney Kings were another team that didn't have a New Zealander on their roster already. Now they do. You know, it's um, it's exciting times. And also, I did, I just you know, to toot the old toot the old horn for a second here. I did have Sam Timmons as my pick to to get an Aussie NDL contract from the Otago Nuggets, and he has. He's the first one of the ten to actually get to do it. And there's a couple more there. I would be cautiously optimistic might get that opportunity as well. Just rolling through some of these uh, finals teams and play and throwing up players who we have discussed this season. Feel free to stop me at any point. Canterbury Rams, uh, Walter Brown and Max Darling, as well as Taylor Britt. Corey Webster's come into the lineup as well. I assume he's going to be playing finals basketball for the Canterbury Rams. They're coming up against the Hawks Bay Hawks. Massive Kiwi contingent there, led by Harum Harris. Jordan Natai went Burko recently. Uh, Doron Rokar was a fantastic shooter. Jared Kenny's the GM, so shout out to him. Is that if that's still a thing? Uh, Franklin yeah, Bulls. If Red Outlet coach, yeah, yeah, and uh, Franklin Bulls have some Breakers connections there, which is an interesting one. They're coming up against the Wellington Saints. Wellington Saints, Leafa Vidanovic. Kelman Potto, Tane Samuel is always a fantastic basketball player that should I've got him as a mandatory viewing or Tane Samuel, Tuatara Ruben Tarangi Rob Lowe uh, Cha Dalton, Charlie Dalton he's fantastic as well as we've talked about all season and Otago Timmins and Ty Webster Ty Webster's come back and he's just putting up points and assists as well Ty Webster might be the most important player in finals basketball. How about that? He genuinely might be. I mean, even if you look at the, like that Tortata team, you have the MVP, Rob Lowe. It's like they've they got a good team around him. They don't have a massively deep team, I will say. I think they are extremely well coached as well by, by Aaron Young there, who's just been added to the, the Tall Blacks um, assistant coach stacks, I noticed as well, which is pretty cool. Um, I'm not 100% sure on if Corey Webster will play in the things because I, I don't know if he played their last game, um, their most recent one, and I think he had I to play a certain amount of games. I heard something on commentary where he stepped on the court and then stepped off just to get the uh, Okay, just to make, keep him eligible, yeah, that, but that's, that's what he'd do. I'm not sure he's been 100% fit. I think he um, he's obviously coming off his off-season. He hasn't been particularly flash getting in there and he's a you know he's very much a rhythm player and he's trying to get that rhythm up going ahead at tall blacks camp so um yeah hopefully he'll rock up then if that's the case and he kept his eligibility there with the old sneaky one second appearance that's all you got to do but the the weird thing about that is the contrast with brother ty webster who just came in and was immediately brilliant for, for otago and has been fantastic the whole way through and, and these every game he's played for them and really has given them that extra shot that they needed at a time when maybe just before he arrived, they, they'd been stumbling a little bit. They hadn't regathered what they'd done earlier on in the season. Now they they really have. And they are, I think, the team most likely to challenge uh, the the Tortata for the title. Um, but it's, it's the funky thing about having like single elimination quarters, semis, final effectively in the space of three days like thursday friday saturday and it's all done that you know you might just have a bad day <laughs> or one of your best players gets injured and then it's uh, you know the hawks bay hawks suddenly storm from sixth place to winning the whole thing like that could that could very feasibly happen but yeah man ty webster 
for sure is has sparked a um a resurgence for that otago nuggets team he's playing excellent basketball as you'd expect from a tall black starter you know he's obviously going to be if not the best local in the competition at least one of the very best like he's and he's delivered on that is that's what you want to see from that kind of signing and it's one of many uh, mid-season signings but i'd say the one in particular that stands out above others I've just been able to, you know, change the move the needle a little bit for some of these teams mid season when they needed it. It is interesting because the Tuatara Nuggets will play less games than these other teams. But I'm mm. curious, which youngster are you most looking forward to playing finals basketball? It seems like I think Dalton he could have a massive, massive impact on finals basketball, which would be epic. But who comes to mind in that young bracket? Well, Charlie Dalton, I believe, won the most improved player of the year award. So that that was that was cool. I think Walter Brown got the young player of the year, which is uh, in this in this scenario, you could have swapped them both around. Like they could have each won the other one. It's, it's not really that much difference between the things. But I mean, those two for sure. I'd I'd like to see because obviously you get down to the um, final stuff, and it's very like. Um, you know, clutch shooting and stuff like this, and those those late uh, buckets become potentially season defining moments. I'm I'm thinking about Cruz Pera Hunt for the Auckland Tuatara, who are a team I think will probably go deep and probably I'm picking them to win the thing. He is a little older than those other two guys I mentioned because he's done his college stuff, he's come out of it, but he's popped up for the Tuatara again mid season, playing off the bench. So not huge, not huge minutes, and they do already have like um, you know Cam Glidden as a starter, just nailing down three pointer after three pointer after three pointer. But Chris Perra Hunt, he's shooting like forty six percent from three pointers. He was all, he was a really good shooter in college from um, from deep as well. He's come in and done the same thing for the Tuatara. He's the kind of player who might just pop up with ten seconds to go down a point and just nail the three-pointer that sends a Tuatara to a championship or something like that. We'll have to wait and see. Busy Aotearoa Sporting Times, major events, major fixtures, lots of buzz around uh, these activities as well. So make sure you enjoy the Aotearoa Sporting Action. Be nice to each other and love yourself first and foremost. You can't be nice to anyone else if you don't love yourself and you're not nice to yourself. So start there, work your way out. Kia kaha, stay beautiful, cheer, cheer.